21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Well, who shot? Where is this? Now, wait a minute. Don't talk so fast. That's 3422. Is that right? And the rest Yeah? Well, who shot him? You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, oh, the nerve center. A oh. call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, I'll send the officers right up there. Yeah, right away. You just wait there. Show them where it is. Yeah, just wait there. Okay. 21st Precinct. Just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been raining hard when I came on the job, and it continued to rain through the night. After I turned out the 12 to 8 platoon at midnight, I went on patrol of the precinct in sector car number 3. It was another quiet tour. The rain helps policemen as well as farmers. It keeps troublemakers off the street. At 2.25, I returned to the station house where I signed reports and communications and caught up generally with the voluminous paperwork that plagues commanding officers. A meeting of all precinct division and borough commanders had been called by the police commissioner for 9 a.m. in the lineup room at police headquarters, 240 Center Street. In order to get some rest, at 3.40 a.m., I lay on the couch in my office with instructions to Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, that I be awakened in time to turn out the platoon for the day tour. Captain. Excuse me, uh, Captain. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Captain. Yeah, what is it? We got a homicide. Oh, where? 3422 Lexington Avenue at the restaurant. Pastry chef, you know the baker. He was shot twice. Uh, Is there a car on the way? Yes, sir, I put out a radio call for a car. It'll be here for you any minute. What time is it? It's 525. What was it, robbery? Well, oh, why, is it still raining, Sergeant? Yes, sir, you better take your raincoat. The information we got so far is that the pastry chef comes to work at midnight. Uh-huh. The restaurant closes at one in the morning. But the pastry chef works all night in the kitchen, baking. The kitchen help starts coming in a little after five. Go ahead, Sergeant. That's it. Well, the first one there went in the kitchen door, found the baker on the floor. The place was a wreck. Mm-hmm. Carl went direct to CB. But when the sector men got on the job and saw what they had, they rang in. Yeah, go on desk off. They said it looked like a robbery. Got a homicide. The car will be here right away, Captain. I better get back on the switchboard. Like all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, that's right. Okay. The detectives are there, yeah. You're welcome. I know it was too quiet at school, Captain. Yeah, have you got your notifications all made, Lieutenant? Uh, that was the medical examiner's office. I've notified the detectives of the division of the homicide squad. I just got the DA's office left. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Will you get me to the DA's office in here? Yes, sir. What detectives went, Red? Battalion Howard. Hello, CB. This is Sergeant Burns at 25. Oh, uh, what about Lieutenant the King? The they called him at home. He's on his way. Him. He was around here until 2 o'clock. Probably didn't even get the bed worn. There's one cure for that, Captain. Have his phone taken out. In a few minutes, sector car number two came by the station house to drive me to 3422 Lexington Avenue, the scene of the homicide. It was still raining hard when we pulled up to the place. The front of the restaurant, a large and popular place, was still dark. The flashlights of cops inside could be seen poking around in the empty dining room. I instructed the operator of the car, Patrolman Coley, to pull around to the kitchen entrance on the side street. Parked there were two sector cars, the patrol sergeant's car, the detective's car, and an ambulance. I got out of the car and crossed the sidewalk to the kitchen door, where a patrolman had been posted by Sergeant Waters to keep out unauthorized persons. The patrolman saluted me as I approached and opened the door. Thank you, Marcia. Sergeant? Oh, hello, Captain. What do we got? Want to take a look? Yeah. Carl, tell the person. Looks like robbery. Fellow was in here alone. Uh-huh. That's just the way he was found. You see? Yeah. One shot got him in the shoulder, the other one in the forehead. Uh, His name is uh, Eugene Francis Tarpin. He rides at 2119 Miller Avenue in the Bronx. 31 years old. He's a baker here. Comes to work at midnight. 
You feel all alone after the place closed at 1 a.m. Makes rolls and bread, pies, cakes, and so forth. Yeah. Works all night until 8 a.m. Want to take a look over here, Captain? Yeah. Of course, usually he doesn't get in to open up the safe until after 8 in the morning. Place opens for business at 6.30. So it's been a custom to leave about $100 in coins and small bills locked in this drawer here. The early cashier has a key to draw and uses the money to change till the boss gets in. Really hacked away on the drawer, huh? Yes, sir. Apparently with that uh, meat cleaver there. Must have taken a good 10 minutes to get it open. No sign of the gun around? No, sir. Must have taken it out with him. He or they? Uh, yes, sir. He or they. The detectives are talking to the fellow that found him and rang in. That fellow over there, Emil Lindvik. He's a fry cook. He's doing here a quarter at the fire. All right, let's go over there. Yes, sir. You don't need all these men around here, Sergeant. You better get some of them back on the job. Yes, sir. Secret something. Thank you. That's, That's what I thought. Oh, uh, look, Captain. Tell me. Captain. Why? Uh, this is Emil Lindvik, Captain. He found the body. He's a fry cook here. All right, come in, and there you are. Right in the middle of the floor. You yes. have to use your key to get in, huh? I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just like every morning. I have to use my key. The door wasn't standing open. It was locked. I have to use my key. Mm-hmm. You always work here alone at night? Oh, yeah, yeah. We baked all night so we'd have fresh rolls and bread and cake for the trade the next day. You see, we got a sign out in the dining room. All baking done on the premises. See there, Captain. Did he always work alone? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're always the first employee in the morning. I'm the fry cook. Uh, I got to get things heated up, the deep fat fryers for the breakfast rush. You know, French fried potatoes, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, was the baker always alone here from the time the restaurant closed at 1 a.m. until you came to work? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He worked alone. Uh, tell me, did you ever see anyone in here with him? Or did he ever tell you he had friends in during the night? Uh, yeah, once in a while. Once in a while, what? Uh, once in a while, he had... The company he didn't come in to work until midnight, like I said. And once in a while, if he had a date, he'd bring her in the kitchen and he'd, he'd work and uh, she'd keep him company. Did you ever see a woman in here with him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Once in a while. Always the same woman? Oh, uh, yeah. He went for that. Did you know her name? Well, uh, look, uh, she's a married woman. She's got her husband. I don't... Like to get her involved. She's involved whether she wants to be or not, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, yes, she is. What's her name? Edna. Edna what? Edna, I don't know. There's Lieutenant King. Uh, I was told Edna Vark, but I, 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 I don't remember. Hello, Captain. Matt? Roy, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, this is Lena Lindvik. He found the body. Lieutenant King, commanding officer of the 21st Detective Squad. Uh, how do you do, Lindvik? What's it look like? A drawer where about $100 was kept was broken up, Lieutenant. Robbery, maybe, but any of this says that the victim never opened the door for anyone he didn't know. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot my key one morning. I had a time convincing him it was me before he'd opened the door. No sign of forcible entrance. No. He's a nice guy. A very nice guy. What a baker. His damages couldn't be beat. They just couldn't be beat. Within a few minutes, detectives of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad arrived to aid the 21st Squad in the investigation. A deputy medical examiner and a representative of the New York County District Attorney's Office were on the scene shortly afterwards. As the ranking officer of the detective division present, Lieutenant King dictated to a stenographer from the Homicide Squad a detailed description of the surrounding conditions and the position, appearance, and condition of the body. Meanwhile, the homicide squad photographer took pictures of the premises and of the body from every possible angle. The deputy medical examiner then made a preliminary examination of the body and ordered its removal to the Bellevue morgue. The first officer on the scene in response to the original call, patrolman Ernest Edelman, placed a UF-95 identification tag on the body. He made a search of the victim's pockets and inventoried the contents in his memorandum book. Fingerprints of the victim were taken by a homicide detective and the body removed to the ambulance. The investigation was underway. Detectives of the 21st Squad and the Homicide Squad were assigned to various tasks in this connection. Detectives Vitaly and Howard, for instance, made a call at an apartment building on West 101st Street, an address found in the victim's wallet. Somebody's coming. Yeah. It's about time. Uh... Mrs. Edna Heppel? 
Yes, that's right. You have to excuse me. I thought you were somebody else. I thought you were my husband. What is it? We're detectives. All right. Well, you got him. Every time you turn around, I'm being waked up at 7 o'clock in the morning. He's in some jail. So he's getting into some kind of trouble. Can we come in? Sure, come ahead. I'm used to it. I don't mind the house. I haven't had a chance to straighten up yet. That's okay. I'm Detective Howard. This is Detective Vitale. How are you doing? Well, what did you do now? He was down in Jersey, Kenton. Wrote me to be home last night, 10.30 the latest. He show up? I asked him, did he show up? He did not. Never seen a man like him. It's a wonder I've stuck with him this long. I've been wanting to leave him and wanting to leave him, but I stuck like a fool. What's he in for now? We don't have your husband, Miss Pebble. You don't? No, we don't. Well, what do you want, then? Do you know a man named Eugene Francis Tarpin? Oh, sure, Eugene. I know, Eugene. He in trouble? What do you do? He's never been in trouble before. He's dead. Dead? He was shot. <laughs> Mind if I sit down? No, no matter how. He did it. That's what we're trying to find out. How long have you known him? He was a man, three, four, five months, something like that. I was thinking of marrying him. You're married already, aren't you? Married? You don't call this married, do you? Works out of town all the time, never sends me any money, hardly. He's just me to run around with this man and that one. How often did you see Eugene Carpenter? Oh, two, three times a week, I don't know. I was going to get a divorce, and we were going to get married. At least we were thinking about getting married. Did your husband know Tarpon? Yeah, oh, sure, he knew Eugene. He didn't like him, though. Why not? Well, on account of me, I guess. On account of... I was interested in Eugene. He didn't like him at all. Where is your husband now? Look, don't ask me where he is now. I don't know. Well, that was due five days ago, and here I am with hardly a nickel in the house, and he hasn't showed up. He got off his construction job near Trenton last night. He's supposed to be home. I thought you were him at the door. Listen... You don't think he killed you, do you? What do you think? Don't ask me. I don't know. I didn't ask you what you know. I asked you what you think. Well, I wouldn't put it past him. I'll say that. Hey, poor thing. Such a nice guy. Really a nice guy. Yes, so we understand. Yeah. Guess it always happens to nice guys, huh? I guess. Couldn't happen to a bum like that husband of mine. It's got to happen to a nice guy like you. Well, that's life for you. In addition to assigning detectives to run down what leads existed, Lieutenant King and members of the 21st Squad and the Homicide Squad remained at the restaurant to question employees as they came to work and to talk to the proprietor of the place. I stayed there myself until 20 minutes after 8 when sector car number 1 came by to take me to police headquarters, 240 Center Street, for the scheduled meeting of all borough, division, and precinct commanders in the lineup room. The meeting, called by the new police commissioner to explain his policy in regard to the enforcement of laws relating to gambling and public morals, lasted until 11.15 a.m. At that time, I returned to the 21st in order to change into civilian clothes and finally go off duty. Hello, Sergeant. Captain. Oh, what's doing? Oh, it's quiet, to her. There's a lot of calls from the press on that homicide, that's all. A couple of messages for you. Nothing looks important. I'll sign the blotter, sir. Yes, sir. Take the call. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. All right, 19. You go to meal now. All right, Sergeant. Lieutenant King? Yes, sir. I just want to see the captain. Oh. Uh, Matt, uh, you all through up there? Yes, sir. Uh, your messages, Captain? Oh, thanks. What's it look like, man? Yeah, it looks like robbery, Captain. Money missing out of the drawer. Mm-hmm. There's another angle, too. This Baker Tarpin was going with a married woman. The husband was supposed to be home last night and didn't show. We want to talk to him. Is the husband that kind of guy? Mm, I don't know. Any husband can be that kind of guy. Then you think robbery's out? No, not necessarily. The money was taken. I had a long talk with the owner of the restaurant. This Tarpin was pretty cautious when he was working there alone. He wouldn't open up that door unless he was sure the person had wanted in. Mm-hmm. If it was robbery, I figured it had to be someone Tarpon knew and someone who knew where that change was kept. Former employee, maybe. Yeah, it could be. The proprietor told me about a kitchen helper he fired last week. He came in drunk and nasty a couple of times and let him go. Did Tarpon know him? 
Yeah, I know him. Got a couple of men out there tracing the boy. His name is Julio Fernando Organza. Moved from his last address a week ago. People there said they thought he went to Bridgeport, Connecticut to work. Well, and it doesn't look so good, hmm? Nothing. At the moment, I like the burnt-up husband angle a little better. Yeah, it does look a little better. 21st, please, thanks, Sergeant. Got Howard and Vitaly over there yeah. planted, waiting for him to show up at home. Oh, yes, uh-huh. Captain Canelli. Yeah. Dr. Russell, the principal of CS-88, calling in for you. Oh, all right. I'll take it in my office. Yes, well, I'm interested to know how it comes out, man. So am I, Captain. Well, I've got to get upstairs. All right, I'll see you. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. Yes, Dr. Rostall. Oh. Oh, well, uh, I was supposed to go off duty at 8 this morning, but we uh, had a homicide break. Yeah. I see. Well, I'll be back on the job at 8 tomorrow morning. Will it keep until then? Uh-huh. Well, all right, I'll stay around and meet you here. One thirty. All right. Goodbye, Mr. Rastorn. <sighs> I had more than two hours to wait before the visit from Dr. Rustall, the principal of public school 88, on what he said was an urgent matter. In the meantime, detectives Vitaly and Howard maintained their plant at the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Phil Heppel, waiting for him to return. The woman of the house, Miss Edna Heppel, was in the kitchen. Detective Howard watched out the front window down onto the sidewalk as Vitaly sat on the studio couch. What do you see down there, Whitey? Nothing. Hmm. Hey, you know what? No, what? I went to the candy store to ring in Lieutenant King. I called my wife. Yeah? And I told her I got stuck. We had a homicide and I wouldn't be home. Well, what'd she say? She said, bring home the evening papers so she could read about it. I said, honey, I'll tell you all about it. No. Uh-huh. You want to read it in the paper? You know, something I, I don't think she trusts me. Where do you think you're going to go at 8 o'clock in the morning? It beats me. Well, I don't know where he is. See what I told you about him being unreliable? Yeah, we see. Not getting your lunch time? Is it? All I got, I can whip up is a can of soup and some saltine. Oh, we're not hungry, Miss Pebble. Well, I'm getting hungry. You don't mind if I fix them for myself? No, not at all. Chris, man with a suitcase getting out of a cab. Is that your husband, Miss Pebble? Yeah, that's him, that's Phil. All right, away from the window. Imagine. I got a can of soup and a few saltines in the house and take taxi cab. See what I mean? Miss Pebble, my partner is going up on the next landing out in the hall. What for? Go ahead, Whitey. All right. Up here. What's the idea? I want to wait in the kitchen. You answer the door, all right? Yeah, all right, but I don't get the production. I don't want you to break the news to him about Gene. Gene didn't go to me? That's the idea, but don't tell him we're here. I didn't? I'll know soon enough. All right? Oh, I would mean to watch it. I guess I can. Go ahead. Oh, don't close it. But that's good. Okay. All right! Hi. Look what the wind blew in. So all you got to say to me, Edna? Look at the wind blew in? I got plenty more to say to you. What? What? As if you didn't know. Well, tell me. Sure, I'm just itching to. Gene Tarpin got killed. No kidding. No kidding. Who killed him? Well, a couple of cops were here and told me about it, and they got a sneaky suspicion you did. Well, they're out of their minds. I was in Trenton. I just got off the train. I bet. Look, if I was going to kill somebody, you don't think I'd kill him over you, do you? You told him to stay away from me. You told him to stay away from me or you'd kill him. Now, you forget you ever heard that. I'll forget nothing. You didn't say anything to the cops about it. What if I did? You did. I'll break every bone in your body. That's what I swear. I'll break every bone in your body. Oh, fine husband I got. You don't go home and he's supposed to be dead. He brings me nothing but a load of dirty laundry. Now he's going to break every bone in my body. You're asking for it, Edna. You're asking for it right between your eyes. I don't need much encouragement. Who are you? Police officer, you just stay right where you are. What's the idea? You'll find out what the idea is. Okay, Whitey. Right here. All right, old Phil. What are you looking for? I got nothing. Take a look in the bag, will you, Whitey? Yeah. Listen, if you think I had something to do with that baker getting killed, you're out of your mind. I got off the job in Trenton late last night. I took the train in this morning. I just got here 15, 20 minutes ago. That's where I was, isn't that right, Edna? That's where you said you were. You and Tarleton didn't get along so well, did you? 
Listen, I was out of town breaking my back on a job. He was chasing after my wife. Would you get along with a guy like that? He wasn't chasing after me. I was chasing after him. You stay out of this. I think you better stay out of it, Mrs. Heppel. Just sit down right there. It's a liar. Born liar. Nothing in the bag, Chris. Even if he wanted to tell the truth, he wouldn't know how. What are you trying to do to me? You better just sit down there, Mrs. Heppel, and listen. What'd you do in Trenton? Well, it wasn't exactly in Trenton. It was outside of Trenton on a road job. I ran a bulldozer. For who? For the state of New Jersey on a road job. You got finished up last night? That's right, last night. I got finished up and paid off. Where'd you spend the night? Down there in Trenton. This rooming house where I stayed. The name of the rooming house. It's got no name. It's done by Mrs. Weimart. Mrs. Wallace Weimart. You can call her. Stayed there last night, took the train this morning. Is that right? Told you it was right. Have you ever been arrested before, Phil? What do you mean before? Arrested now? Were you ever arrested? Yeah, I was arrested. He was arrested, but big. Keep your mouth shut. Ever do any big time? Yeah, I did some big time. Where? Sing Sing. For what? I'm only at assault. I got into a fight with a guy. What'd you get out of it? I did 22 months. Must come close to killing him. It was touch and go. Phil, this time it looks like you made it. Yeah. Let's go. It was a quarter of two when I finished with Dr. Rust Hall, the principal of PS-88. As soon as he left my office, I went upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. The suspect in the homicide case, Phil Heppel, was sitting next to a desk where Detective Howard was taking his pedigree. Detective Vitale was on the telephone on the other side of the room. And what year was that? 1945. Oh, uh, excuse me, Whitey. Oh, yes, sir, Captain. Is Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir. Thank you. Was this uh, an honorable discharge? Yeah, it was an honorable discharge. What made you think uh, it wasn't? Got Captain Canelli. Hello, oh, Matt. Thanks. Look, uh, I know you're up to your neck. I'm sorry to bother you. Oh, that's all right. I'm just waiting for the thing to wrap up while we're checking on his Trenton story. I got Bender and DeLuca out facing the dishwasher, so he looks better. Mm-hmm. What is it, Captain? Well, uh, Dr. Rusthall, the principal of BS-88, was just in here. He's uh, got three boys over there who've been flashing a lot of money around the school today and yesterday. He says he thinks there's only one way they could have gotten hold of it. Yes, sir. Uh, pretty bad actors, he says, and he thinks we ought to take a look into it. I asked him to come up here with me, but he had to get back. I told him you'd send a man around to talk to him, okay? Yeah, sure, Captain. I'll send someone over this afternoon. Yeah. Come in, Chris. Trenton just called back. Yeah? Hello, Captain. Chris? They checked out that road project and rooming house both. Uh-huh. Yeah, Heppel didn't stay at the rooming house last night. He was fired off the road job on Monday. Didn't work yesterday as he said he did. Mm. Well, looks like that wraps it up. Hmm? Yes, sir. Tell Whitey to bring him in here again. Yes. Whitey? Yeah? The lieutenant wants you to bring him in here. Okay. He was at the rooming house night before last, they said, but not last night. Mm, I got an idea where he was last night. All right, Captain. All right, go on in, sir. Come right over here and sit down. Where? Right there. Shut the door, Whitey. Yes, sir. All right, Phil, what do you say we stop wasting time? I'm willing. By your own admission, you didn't like Tarpon. He was running after your wife. Listen, if he'd asked me, I'd have given it to him. You killed him, you know it. I was in Trenton. You were, huh? Let's get this straight. You worked until yesterday afternoon. You slept in that rooming house last night. Took a train from Trenton this morning. Went right from Penn Station to your house. That's what I told you. You've been telling us nothing but lies. You were in New York. You went to that restaurant, knocked on the door, top and knew you let you in. When you got in there, you shot him. Broke open that drawer to make it look good. That's not so. I'll get it. I was in Trenton. 21st squad. You went to get it settled about your wife and you shot him. Uh, Bender on the outside line for you, Lieutenant. All right, thanks. 21st squad, Lieutenant King. Yes, then. Yes. What? Oh, he did, huh? All right. Yeah. You coming in with him? Okay, good. Why are you lying to us, Phil? I'm not lying. And I didn't kill him. No, you didn't kill him. That was one of my detectives on the phone. They got the man who did. Mm-hmm. Who was that? The dishwasher? Yes, sir. Again, sir. I found him in a flat on 124th Street. He had the gun there and the money he took. He admits to killing him. Yeah, you see, I told you. 
Well, now, how do you like that? I told you I didn't do it. I told you. How many times did I have to tell you? Why did you have to lie about where you were? This is no spot to lie if you want to get straightened out. You were in New York. You should have said so. I wasn't in New York. I was in Trenton. In jail. Oh. I got a little drunk the day before yesterday. I got in a fight with a guy and I wound up in a can. I didn't want to say anything about it because I still owe a little time from that bit I did. Getting in jail down there to get my parole revoked. You're not going to say anything about that, are you? If I do, you'll hear about it from your parole officer. Okay. Can I go? In a little while. Go out there and sit on the bench for now. Okay. Leave it open. Yeah. It's all right, Whitey. You can sit there. Captain. You ever see anything that looks so good, blow so high, so fast? No, but one killer is as good as another, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you want me for anything else, Lieutenant? I'm carrying a pocket full of squeals. Oh, yeah, Chris, take a ride over to PS 88 and talk to the principal. He's got three boys he's kind of worried about. Yes, right away. Come on, Captain. Chris? <laughs> Kitchen worker. I had it pegged the other way, Captain. I had it pegged on the husband for sure. Did you? Yes. <laughs> what I get for trying to cherche la femme when I should have been chercheing the dishwasher. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is the police department. So your place. Well, who? What's his name? Do you know him? At what party? Or did you see him take it? Yeah. And so it goes, around the clock, All through right, the week, right. every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Eric, Wendell Holmes, Santo Sotega, Harold Stone, Ross Martin, Bill Quinn, and Mandel Kramer. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking.